All right. Um, all right. So let's get started. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, my talk. Uh, I'm Eugene Chua. I'm a graduate student, fifth year at uh, UCSD, uh, UC San Diego. I'm going to be talking about the time and thermal time. I guess some of you might have heard uh, a version of this talk before, so uh, you know, hopefully I'll add something new or be able to address your criticisms or you know your, your objections this time. Uh, so this work uh, spans out of um, branches out of my interest in thermodynamics. Uh, this is my dissertation research topic, broadly speaking. And also my work with Craig Calendar on uh, the emergence of time and quantum gravity. Specifically, we worked on semi-classical approaches and how the semi-classical time approach uh, might run into some problem circularity. So similar strategy here, I'll be talking about how maybe uh, one reading of the thermal time hypothesis, which maybe not everyone agrees on, perhaps even the author, um, uh, runs into a circularity and um, you know that that um, that might be much, right. So let's get started. Uh, my plan here roughly uh, is to, so I'll start off briefly by motivating the problem, what exactly the background of the problem is and why exactly thermal time hypothesis uh, of my construal is supposed to resolve. And then I will go into some background into how, uh, what thermal time is or what the hypothesis is saying uh, by running through some background on the algebraic approach uh, and the KMS condition, which is a way in quantum mechanics to sort of talk about uh, thermal equilibrium. And then I'll sort of uh, then state the thermal time hypothesis before going into some problems, uh, two problems with the thermal time hypothesis. Firstly, uh, problem with the notion of equilibrium and whether time might be involved there. And the second problem, the time in uh, with the notion of physical probabilities and expectation values and so on, and how time might show up there as well. So I will conclude by sort of suggesting that there might be some conceptual tensions within the foundations of the thermal time hypothesis on my construal. Right. So let's go ahead and start. Um, so the problem of time, uh, very briefly, right, if you try to quantize uh, general relativity by, so for example, putting in the Hamiltonian form 3 plus 1, the EDM formulation, and then you try to quantize it with constraints such as uh, time reparameterization invariance, space time disappears and space remains uh, according to Kiefer anyway. So you, you have your three metrics and you have the time. And then uh, when you try to quantize it, the space is only the space of three metrics. There's no time in there, um, roughly speaking. All right, so time has disappeared in this view. So suppose, you know, imagine you have a space time, you try to fully, you can fully it in some way, but you can also fully it in some other way. So reparameterization invariance, leads to the um the result that something that originally for example in the classical uh not classical but you know standard quantum mechanics you have a schrodinger equation <clears throat> with the you know hamiltonian leading to time evolution but in some gravity you without you end up with something that schematically looks like this uh why it's called the wheeler the wheel equation where the hamiltonian uh sort of does not lead to time evolution in fact it leads to zero there's no time evolution at all you can see this kind of like a time independent schrodinger equation there's no time evolution in this case. Uh, and this is a result of the time reparameterization invariance. And this is one big problem in quantum gravity. Well, it's the problem of time, but there are many um, sort of minor sub, like many different sub problems in the problem of time. So it might be more accurately called uh, the problems of time. But I'll be focusing roughly on this uh, with this in the backdrop. I won't be so going into much uh, detail on this because this is not the main focus per se, is in the backdrop. All right. One possible interpretation of uh, this sort of result that, you know, that we have a fundamental equation, the wheeler the weight equation, the one that uh, has no time evolution, is to interpret it as a fundamentally a timeless ontology, right? So this is not necessarily the only way to take, to interpret the uh, equation. There are many, there's uh, many work by this, uh, on this uh, topic by other people. Um, but this is one possible interpretation you can take, right? So you think that the fundamental equation of our universe is timeless, so the ontology of the universe is uh, fundamentally timeless. There's no uh, timed concepts there per se. So then there's a question here, uh, which is, you know, if we had a uh, the timeless regime, then how do we, you know, we we all clearly observe time around us, or you know, if things evolving in time in some sense, right? Maybe not Newtonian time, but some kind of time in some sense. So how do we recover that? And one of the ways to think of it is to use the uh, internal time approach, which is to say. Well, you know, maybe fundamentally uh, timeless ontology uh, does not, you know, uh, per se support the idea of time, but we can always try to find something within this timeless ontology 
uh, a parameter and we can try to define that as time if we can find the right states within this uh, timeless state space of pre metrics uh, you know, like a flex space. So some systems can play the role of clocks or these states can play the role of clocks with which uh, one can then define the dynamics of other systems relationally. So this is sometimes called the internal time approach, broadly speaking, again, you know, because of how this, this pro program has been going for like 30, 40 years, right? So there's lots of stuff, different approaches um, that might be roughly considered the same thing, but maybe the people might differ. But this is why I think of it, like uh, there's this thing called internal time, which is a parameter, uh, which is the approach to quantum gravity, where you try to define time by finding a parameter within the fundamentally timeless ontology. Uh, with yeah, given the wheel of the way equation, the backdrop of the problem of time. So something like this, right? So you even if you have no time, you can sort of look at, you can find systems related to each other in certain ways, and then maybe certain things behave in such a way that it could function as clocks in a functional sense, in which in that you know, for example, you find an uh, atom that repeats. It's uh, oscillations or like a particle that repeats oscillations over time. And then we can use that, or like maybe not over time, sorry, it oscillates in some pattern, right? Which which you can then define as time. And then we can use that to define other systems uh, dynamics in terms of this uh, time. So thermal time approach, uh, thermal time hypothesis in my view uh, does this by finding the right states which uh, are taken to be the thermal states. If we can, find thermal states, then the claim for the hypothesis on my reading is that time is defined, can be defined as the parameter according to which these states are in thermal equilibrium. So you find thermal states, and then thermal states uniquely pick out parameters, which looks like time in some sense. For, for example, maybe it's like a one parameter thing. It has a you know monotonic increasing or monotonic changing, I guess, uh, function. And so that's how we can try to define time. So that's broadly why I think the thermal time hypothesis is trying to say. This is a quote from uh, Connors and Rovelli, which is the progenitor of the thermal time hypothesis, right? So because of the absence of a fundamental physical time at the general covariant level, open question is how to understand the physical time flow that characterizes the world in which we live in may um, emerge from the fundamental timeless general covariant quantum field theory, right? So there's a timeless background and we're trying to find out how time emerges from that background. And a radical solution, according to this paper, to, uh, to this problem is based on the idea that one can extend the notion of time flow. So the idea that time changes, right? There's some, something that changes, right? So it's a bit more primitive than direction of time, but so just the fact that there is a parameter which we can like, assign changes to. Uh, the notion of time flow is to general covariant theories, but this flow depends on the thermal state of the system. So the notion of uh, time flow extends naturally to the general uh, covariant theory. Provided that we, uh, they provide three sort of uh, claims, the time flow is interpreted as the one parameter group of autom automorphisms of the observable algebra in the generalized Heisenberg picture. We'll get to what that roughly means later. And we ascribe the temporal properties of the flow to thermodynamical causes, and therefore we tie the definition of time to thermodynamics. So time is defined in terms of thermodynamics. It's not just an analysis of uh, thermodynamical concepts in terms of time, but that you know, we are tying the definition of time to uh, thermodynamics. And we take seriously the idea that in generally covariant context, the notion of time, the time itself is not state independent in that, you know, maybe there's like an unit, like an objective background time as in non-relativistic classical physics, but uh, rather depends on the state in which the system is in. And this kind of ties in nicely to the relativistic picture of how a time is, you know, different coordinate frames or different inertial frames are different, different times, and that's fine. That's just how relativity is, right? And this is from Connors and Rovelli, 1994. And uh, to, to my mind, the natural interpretation of this claim is that we are defining thermal time in relation to thermal states, uh, which is the defining, describing systems in thermal equilibrium, right? So using thermal equilibrium, we can find a parameter according to which the system is in equilibrium and use that, use these thermal states as clocks. So systems in thermal states can function to replace the role of clocks with which you can then uh, you know, define time. Now, my claim here is that finding the right states, the thermal states appears to need time to begin with or some yet to be developed story for how to find these thermal states uh, in the fundamentally timeless context. So con the concept of thermodynamics uh, would develop in a very, very much timed con temporal context 
right? We, and the question is, how do we extend these notions to a timeless context? And to my mind, uh, not much has been done in this respect yet. Of course, there's some work, for example, by Carlo Rovelli and uh, you know, Francesca. And I think there's more to be done here. And it's an open question and it's interesting as well. So some formal stuff before uh, we get to, uh, and on our way to getting to the thermal time hypothesis, the thermal time hypothesis is made in the formal context of the algebraic approach to quantum mechanics, and more specifically in the Heisenberg picture, as mentioned just now. So in this picture, you have a time independent uh, state or like a history with appropriate time independent observables, uh, O represented by subadjoint operators in Hilbert space. So this is the usual uh, Heisenberg picture where you have a Heisenberg equation of motion, uh, the, the change of a over t, over t uh, given the uh, change of a over time uh, is a commutator of h and uh, a, and such that uh, you know uh, a unitarily evolves over time. So this is the usual sort of Heisenberg counterpart to the Schrödinger equation, and they are formally equivalent. So the algebraic approach then takes the idea of uh, you know we are we're focusing on the observables now, auto operators now, as opposed to uh, the state, and we want to understand the structure of these operators. What can we do with them? What are possible with them? How do they change? Uh, how do they relate to each other, and so on, right? And technically speaking, there's a way to do it, which is to understand the structure of bounded uh, observables acting on Hilbert space in terms of algebra, the C style algebra, uh, specifically about Neumann algebra. So this form uh, roughly fulfills the following formal conditions, addition, scalar multiplication, operator multiplication, non-commutative, of course, uh, the adjoint conjugation, having a norm, and close under weak topology for the von Neumann algebra. So these are all formal properties which wouldn't be uh, playing too big of a role in my arguments. They're just a way to get clear on what exactly the formal structure we're talking about is. right? And then over this, this uh, space of uh, this algebra observable, we can define a state, uh, omega, which is a normalized positive linear functional, which takes a, one of these uh, observables to uh, a complex number. And if uh, A is self-adjoint, as we, uh, if we usually uh, demand, then omega A is real. Uh, and intuitively, we can interpret omega A as the expectation value of A, right? Because it spits out a real number uh, that is between zero and one. So for each omega on W, we can furthermore, uh, you know, so far we have we are stuck in this very abstract algebra picture, the you know, structure of observables. But the GNS uh, formulation or the representation, I don't remember the, the the name of that, uh, the full name of these people, I can't hard to remember. Uh, the GNS representation provides a concrete representation in terms of Hilbert space and vice versa, and it connects the abstract algebraic uh, structure to a uh, familiar structure of quantum mechanics, basically Hilbert space. So whatever we can do in the observable structure, we can also sort of find a counterpart, a concrete counterpart in Hilbert space. So we want follows, I'll kind of move between, I'll just kind of talk about them as so they're the same. I don't think nothing, I don't think anything really turns on this uh, detail. Now, furthermore, for a uh, faithful and normal uh, the omega, so uh, omegas which can be represented in W and which are normal, so the trace of uh, omega is one. Uh, we can use this thing called a Tomita Takesaki uh, theory to define a one parameter modular automorphism group, which is uh, this uh, this thing <laughs> that maps W to W, right? It's automorphism, such that uh, there's always an uh, automorphism group that represents unitary evolution of A, right? So since it represents, it can be, uh, we do have a representation of uh, unitary evolution uh, given the automorphism group. Oh, we are allowed to interpret uh, alpha, uh, which is uh, the dynamics dynamically. However, uh, the alpha is firstly uh, relative to omega, uh, and furthermore, it's a special kind of dynamics, right? So, uh, this omega has the property that uh, you know the, this holds. So, omega, when you um, apply the time dynamics, also apply this dynamics onto a. Um, Omega stays the same. So it's in a sense, if you think of omega as the expectation values, then you can kind of think of uh, this thing as saying the expectation values don't change under uh, alpha. But when should we interpret alpha dynamically? Right. So the dynamics associated with alpha, uh, you know, leaving the omega and change is a very special one. But in standard cases, a system in an arbitrary quantum state need not be an unchanging state over time. In these cases, the dynamics associated with alpha does not describe the dynamics of the system. So put simply, the two dynamics, right? So the alpha dynamics and the system's actual dynamics need not always line up. And we should not automatically interpret alpha as the dynamics of that system. Now again, to the details on this, it's just a bit when we when we talk about the notion of equilibrium uh, later on. But one sort of expectation value stays you know, stationary, 
given some dynamics. Those associated with systems in thermal equilibrium. So idea of constant temperature over time, or there's no net heat exchange of uh, thermal energy between the two systems. If you are talking about two systems being equilibrium. Right. So for this special case, uh, the dynamics associated with alpha does line up with the dynamics of a system in thermal equilibrium. The actual dynamics of the system is, in fact, the, the, the sort of dynamics uh, described by alpha, where omega stays constant. So in this case, alpha omega uh, can be interpreted as the dynamics for such a state, and omega can be interpreted as the thermal state. Specifically, if omega satisfies the KMS condition, which is uh, kind of the, how the, the time evolution of A commutes with B. Right, in the sense saying that it's unchanging. Uh, importantly, any omega can be shown to satisfy this relative to the modular group dynamics defined by omega. So basically every state has uh, some dynamics alpha such that uh, that state's uh, expectation values, if you interpret it that way, or like the, the numbers associated with the expect the, that uh, observable stays constant. What all this is to say is that, well, you know, if you take a step back, systems, uh, every state of a system or a system in any state can have can be in equilibrium in the sense that it can remain unchanging over some dynamics, given some dynamics, right? So any system can not change uh, given some dynamics. But obviously not every system is not changing, uh, at least in, in the observed world. It seems kind of arcane abstract, uh, abstract when we think about the specific formulation of the KMS condition. But one physical anchor uh, is that in the finite dimensional case, when we interpret omega as the Gibbs state, which is uh, e beta uh, with the h, where the h is a Hamiltonian over the trace, which is the partition function, um, holds. So the Gibbs state, if we interpret omega as the Gibbs state, which is a uh, rho beta, which is given by this, and such that uh, we feel the constraint that the trace of rho a equals to this, and we can define that as the expectation value of a. We can, uh, and then we give the we use the usual dynamics alpha. We interpret the alpha dynamics in terms of the unitary evolution of the Heisenberg equations on motion, which is what we saw just now. Then the Gibbs state satisfies the KMS condition, right? Which is not uh, too surprising because we do know that the Gibbs state represents a system in thermal equilibrium in the finite dimensional case, at least for a system and a finite degrees of freedom. And you know, it's not surprising the dynamics of that system, which we already know to be in the Gibbs state satisfies the dynamics such that the expectation values do not change. And the converse is true as well. The unique thermal state satisfying the KMS condition is a Gibbs state. Uh, yeah. Oh, need to, need to delete this plus an anticity condition. Um, anyway, uh, furthermore, in infinite dimensional quantum systems, uh, the trace of a, the density matrix is ill-defined as uh, is commonly known. And so the Gibbs state, which is defined in terms of the trace you know, in the partition function cannot be used in those cases per se. However, crucially, the KMS condition can still hold to describe systems in thermal equilibrium, even in those states. Now, interpreted as um, a state of thermal equilibrium, now that we know that uh, a state satisfying the uh, KMS condition is a state in thermal equilibrium, at least in the finite dimensional case, and we want to generalize to the infinite dimensional case, uh, and we, you know, we show that it's, it, it does hold in the infinite dimensional case. Furthermore, we interpret it as a uh, when we interpret it as a thermal uh, state in thermal equilibrium, it satisfies a variety of thermodynamical stability and passivity conditions we typically associate with an equilibrium state, such as stationarity, which is that just the, the system is not changing over time, uh, so thermodynamical stability, the system's free energy is not changing over time, uh, dynamical stability remains over time in a stationary stage, uh, state, arbitrarily close to this uh, current one under small perturbations, which you know, involves changing the dynamics a bit. Um, and energy cannot be extracted from such a state by applying for a finite amount of time uh, any local perturbation of the dynamics, such as uh, sometimes called passivity. In other words, we are when we asked uh, what exact when do exactly does the uh, system's uh, actual dynamics line up with the dynamics uh, given by alpha? And the answer is well, we're only allowed to do that when we're allowed to interpret a system as being in thermal equilibrium. You know, there might be other cases, but so far this is the, the one we know. And as uh, M can, M, uh, M -ch, M can Liu uh, points out, the various stability and passivity conditions associated with some state satisfying the KMS condition, including the ones mentioned above, you know, stationarity, passivity, and so on, dynamical stability, uh, typically requires that the state is assumed tacitly to be stationary with respect to a specified dynamics alpha, which is not too surprising given that it is all um, very rich in like temporal notions and you know, dynamics and changing and over time and so on, right? 
So with uh, this idea of a KMS condition and its connection to thermal, con the, how it's connected to thermal equilibrium in mind, uh, you know, we, we now see an uh, issue, right? Um, that in the standard quantum mechanical context, there's always assumed that there's some background time parameter T featuring the Schrodinger equation or the Heisenberg equation. But in the fundamentally timeless context, that going back to the problem of time, we don't have yet any time or clocks with which we might uh, obviously define the system to be in thermal equilibrium. And so there's no straightforward way to understand the notion of a KMS state as equilibrium state yet. The hypothesis uh, says this. Well, there is a natural flow of time according to which the system is equilibrium given by alpha. So, you know, the, any state defines uh, some alpha such that uh, it, omega remains unchanged over a uh, given alpha. You know, it's a one parameter family of automorphisms. So that's, that's what I interpret as the natural flow of time. And furthermore, uh, if we can justify uh, interpreting the omega as a Gibbs state such that omega equals rho uh, beta, for example, as a thermal state where beta is the inverse uh, temperature, uh, then we can interpret the dynamics of alpha as defining a thermal Hamiltonian. So we just kind of reverse the, the e, you know, e minus h uh, b definition. And we just uh, sort of say you can define it implicitly a thermal Hamiltonian, which is the negative ln of uh, rho beta. So the flow of time is defined by the one parameter state dependent modular automorphism group, uh, which is alpha interpreted now representing equilibrium dynamics, where dynamics is uh, the, given by Hamiltonian, but now we're defining the Hamiltonian in terms of a uh, role. And note that this is distinct from the usual way which uh, we, we do it, which is, you know, we have the Hamiltonian for the system and then we define, you know, uh, what we use that to define a state for the system. And you know, we can, if, if the Hamiltonian happens to be nice, we end up with a, or we know the system to be thermal equilibrium, then we have a Gibbs state, right? So uh, in Pate's, Pate's word, uh, words, we, we ascribe the time flow or the selection of a preferred flow to the statistical properties of the state. So the relevant statistical distribution, the thermal equilibrium distribution, determines a flow which coincides with what we perceive as a physical flow of time. And so on this picture, on this reading of the thermal time hypothesis, uh, systems in thermal equilibrium can play the role of clocks in this fundamentally timeless setting. And this is attractive on the face of it because, uh, you know, if we if all we needed was uh, equilibrium states, and if we had some way of pick out equilibrium states, then it's very nice to just if you can just go and find equilibrium states in this state uh, in this state space, fundamentally timeless. Uh, we define clocks with it, and then we just like do our uh, you know physics as always. So if we could do that, that would be pretty nice, and it's elegant if it works, right? But uh, whether it works or not it remains an open question. And so far, to my knowledge, Swanson is the no Swanson is the only uh, philosopher in his dissertation and a paper from 20, published in 2021 to have tackled the thermal time hypothesis seriously by highlighting some uh, technical challenges. So I want to complement their analysis, uh, complement the, their analysis by proposing and developing some uh, conceptual challenges for the thermal time hypothesis. The gist of my uh, analysis is that, you know, to avoid circularity, the notion which the thermal time hypothesis uses to define time uh, had better not depend on the background notion of time it themselves. So if concepts like equilibrium or statistical state require time to be defined, they would only serve to define time in so far as time had already been defined. Furthermore, it would not serve as a genuine solution to time since uh, your proposal for solving the problem of time requires uh, time. There's a security, circularity there, right? So if it, it requires time to be defined already, then the problem of time will have been resolved to some extent. But if we don't have time, we can't even begin to define the concepts such as equilibrium and statistical state, uh, at least to our best knowledge right now. And then we can't solve the problem of time either. So it will not solve, serve as a genuine solution to the problem of time if uh, we cannot provide a time independent notion of equilibrium or statistical state. Why immediate response, right? Why not just define some internal time relative to some appropriate choice of clock system? Then we use this clock to define relational dynamics. Then we can use this uh, internal time defined relationally to define the notions of equilibrium, entropy, probability, and so on, among other thermodynamic concepts. Now, if we could find an appropriate clock, then that would, uh, however, address the problem of time already, right? So, you know, this is one immediate response that I kind of want to diffuse. So, if we could find a clock, that will address the problem of time rather than the thermal time defined by the thermal time hypothesis. So on my perspective, I'm taking the hypothesis seriously as a proposal that attempts to directly define times in terms of uh, time, and maybe times as well, in terms of thermal equilibrium 
rather than you know maybe something a bit weaker like we're just trying to ana analyze the notions of equilibrium in terms of time or you know, analyze the notions of the thermodynamics in terms of time right want to uh, take the original proposal seriously as saying well we're trying to solve the problem of time and to do that we need to define some uh you know we need to find some way to define clocks using thermodynamic properties such as thermal equilibrium but this kind of runs into some worry and I'm going to list uh, two conceptual challenges for this uh, uh, hypothesis now. <clears throat> so the first conceptual challenge for the thermal time hypothesis is to provide an account of what an equilibrium state is independent of time. So what does equilibrium mean independent of time, such that we can then find these uh, equilibrium states within the fundamentally timeless ontology with which we can then define a clock or the time from it. So, uh, Clonis and Rovelli takes a rather deflationary science, right? Uh, so equilibrium state is a state that whose module automorphism group is the time translation group, which means that, well, the state uh, is a state such that the two dynamics, the spectral systems uh, dynamics in whatever dynamics mean in timeless uh, context lines up with the equilibrium state, uh, lines up with the module automorphism group. But when are we allowed to interpret the module automorphism group as the time translation group? So uh, Kamen and Ru uh, Ricci kind of, uh, raises a conceptual worry in kind of a somewhat offhand manner because they didn't really focus on, they're not really focusing on this per se. This is like a foot, uh, like a small point that followed, uh, that is then followed by a footnote, right? So the modular group defined or determined by an arbitrary faithful normal state on the von Neumann algebra may lack a natural uh, dynamical interpretation, which is kind of what I was saying just now that the, the you know, even though we have this dynamics given by alpha, it's a very special kind of dynamics and we need to provide some kind of way to interpret this dynamic physically in terms of systems in the real world before we can say that this uh, alpha is the dynamics of the system in that state, right? So if we lack this natural dynamical interpretation, we probably need to use scare codes to uh, when we understand uh, understand beta as the inverse temperature and you know and basically interpret the state thermodynamically or like in, in, interpret the state physically. Alpha does not automatically mandate a dynamical interpretation and a prior determination of the notion of equilibrium is required. So Hag et al. Uh, met, essentially puts forth this uh, same point in 1967 when they introduced uh, the connection between the KMS condition and thermal equilibrium. All right, we assume the existence of an automorphism, you know, uh, alpha essentially, for which omega is invariant. It then follows that there exists a unitary operator on Hilbert space which implements this uh, automorphism. This does not mean, however, that the system actually moves according to this automorphism. It only means that it is possible to choose the dynamics, for example, the infant particle forces and the external forces, for example, in the Hamiltonian, such that with these forces, the system in the state omega would be in equilibrium. So if the so forces happen to be different, the basically the system happened to be in a certain uh, physical state, the automorphism is not a trans time translation and H is not the Hamiltonian of the system and the state omega is not stationary. All this is to say what I've just said just now uh, in much more precise ways that the alpha or like the automorphism group is not instantly or like uh, automatically dynamical. It is only dynamical if the system you're trying to describe uh, is in certain states, uh, certain states also with certain dynamics. Bonson points out the same thing, right? Any statistical state determines the dynamics according to which it is a KMS state. However, if rho is a non-equilibrium state, the resultant thermal time flow does not align with our ordinary conception of time. Because by the lights of thermal time, a cube of ice in a cup of hot coffee is an invariant equilibrium state. And the same problem arises in the quantum domain. Only for states which are true equilibrium states will thermal time correspond to physical time, right? So if we just took a laissez-faire approach to equilibrium and we say, well, whenever a system has a, you know, uh, whenever you can see that it satisfies KMS condition uh, with respect to some alpha, then the system is in equilibrium, then any system essentially is in equilibrium because there's always some alpha for some, some system in some states that uh, that is in equilibrium according to alpha, right? But that's not kind of what we say, like you say, you know, a cube of ice in a hot, 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 cup of hot coffee is in, is in very equilibrium state, and that seems kind of counterintuitive to what our idea of what um, time is or like how equilibrium works in ordinary circumstances. So it's highly revisionary if we wanted to adopt this more laissez-faire approach to equilibrium. So the thermal time hypothesis must rule out the fact that any arbitrary state can define a thermal time because there is some there is some alpha associated with any state, any omega. 
So it must restrict the hypothesis only to the thermal time defined by some privileged classes of states over omega, which are really equilibrium states. So we're looking at the fundamentally timeless ontology. We're trying to find systems which are really equilibrium states as opposed to systems which are not equilibrium states. Now, the usual way of uh, in standard quantum mechanical context of picking out equilibrium states refer to thermodynamical properties such as stationarity, stability, and passivity, as we just saw just now, right? And these are all implicitly defined in terms of some background time parameter, which is what M. M Ken Liu uh, pointed out just now in twin, uh, when I summarized the notion of equilibrium. Now, uh, Kellen says something similar as well. Well, equilibrium states are by definition time independent, and how we operationally find them is that you know, systems in equilibrium state if its properties are consistently described by thermodynamical or thermodynamic theory. But thermodynamic theory itself is a th theory steeped in temporal processes, right? Notion of, uh, you know, change over time, stationarity, approach to equilibrium, the zero flaw, second law, right? These are all notions steeped in time. So the equilibrium, uh, and Landau and Lipschitz says the same thing, right? So equilibrium states are states which are necessarily arrived at after some relaxation time. So we put a system there, we wait a while, well, we've, after some appropriate uh, waiting, the system becomes uh, arrives at equilibrium. So these are notions of uh, uh, deeply steeped in time. So there's a dilemma here, right? The, either the thermal time hypothesis on my reading is circular since it implicitly requires a background time parameter, or it is yet unjustified since it's yet to justify why some states are privileged uh, equilibrium states with which we can cash out the thermal time hypothesis. So one way to sort of sidestep is it well maybe or maybe usually your notion of equilibrium requires time, but that's not necessary, right? So Pate's uh, kind of suggests the same this uh, direction. We would need some intrinsic definition of time, sorry, intrinsic definition of equilibrium, uh, one that does not ref uh, refer to time. So if we could do that, then we can say well even the fundamentally timeless uh, fun ontology, there's no time yet, but we can easily just uh, find systems in uh, equilibrium if we had this intrinsic notion that does not refer to time, or well, maybe not easily, but we can find it, right? It's not in principle root all. For Valley 1993 proposes one such definition in a prior, work slightly prior to the hyperthermal time process per se, the one that we talked about, we're talking about now. Um, for a system equilibrium as with coordinates PQ, such that we can separate a small and macroscopic region S prime from with coordinates PQ, uh, P and Q prime, from the much larger system. So we have a box and then we find a smaller part of the box, right? And we are trying to compare the two systems and we assume weak interactions between S prime and S sub prime, which is the, the, big, the big box, the rest of the box. The interactions is uh, Hamiltonian and we can assume the interaction of Hamiltonian approximately vanishes because of the weak interactions. And so as a result, the probability distribution for the system, such as uh, the, the statistical state of the system uh, factorizes. Right, so the role of the system in classical mechanics uh, factorizes uh, given these assumptions. Right, so Rovelli wants to say that it, the system in equilibrium is defined uh, in terms of this intrinsic definition. At least it was a proposal that he raised. Right, we want to describe describe a system intrinsically in equilibrium in terms of this uh, role. So basically, you're just saying, well, you know, role factorizes with the the bigger part, of the, the smaller part of the box factorizes with the bigger part of the box in terms of its density, and that. That is, that is equilibrium, right? And we so far have not referred to time at all because it's just P's and Q's and P's and Q's on the face of it does not require notions of time, right? So uh, Rovelli points out to uh, Landau Lipschitz in 1980 proposing one such, just such a definition that you know the role factorizes when the system is in equilibrium. However, Lana Lipschitz does follow up immediately with a caveat that uh, Rovelli doesn't mention, which is that it should be emphasized once more that this property holds only over not too long intervals of time, because over long enough times, uh, the effects of interaction to subsystems, which we assume to be weak at a small, at a, at a appropriate time scale, will ultimately appear, right? So all this is to say that it seems like uh, well, Rovelli, Rovelli takes the factorization property as the definition of in, or like as a one way to define intrinsic equilibrium. It's clearly not intended by London Lipschitz to define equilibrium per se, rather the subsystems of systems. Um, in equilibrium can be understood in terms of this condition for suitable periods of time. The appropriate time scale is such that the two uh, the two subsystems factorize or like have weak interactions, which is over a certain time scale, also in terms of interactions, uh, but not always, only for uh, all practical purposes when we want to do uh, equilibrium thermodynamics on a system that may not be you know in like in equilibrium as a whole. Right? We just want to find subsystems such that we can do equilibrium thermodynamics for appropriate time scale. And we always have to keep the time scale in mind. 
So it seems like, uh, you know, this makes implicit reference to time. Even though on the face of it, it's just about P's and Q's, there is an implicit reference to time because we are saying that for some P's, not all, uh, not no time, but for some times, uh, this equation holds, but not for all times. So there is an implicit reference to time, at least in the classical case. And this, this only states the factorizability of two subsystems, uh, you know, assumed to, uh, to be true for some time scales. Back to, we are back to the dilemma for now with an Osha equilibrium, even, uh, you know, despite the attempt to define uh, implicit equilibrium. So we, because we don't have a good notion of implicit equilibrium yet, or like equilibrium independent of time, whether that be a background clock or some background Newtonian time, we are back to the dilemma for now. So that's the first worry, right? The notion of equilibrium seems to be steeped in time, and that seems to be the more obvious point. And I want to make a second uh, conceptual worry as well, this time in a more maybe foundational notion, which is probability. So the second conceptual challenge overall is to my mind, how to understand the concept of statistical, statistical state against the backdrop of a fundamentally timeless ontology and the problem of time. And there are three ways in which this challenge manifests uh, uh, in terms of how to, how to understand the notion of normalization in probabilities uh, in the timeless context, notions of expectation values in the timeless context, and the notion of unitarity in the, con the timeless context. Recall that a statistical state a density matrix rho corresponding to a normal state omega over w of the Volnheim algebra, algebra is intricately connected with the expectation values it provides and hence with probabilities. So normal states, uh, density matrix, uh, the trace that satisfy the normal condition, so like trace rho equals to one, um, defines a countably additive probability measure over projection operators or eigenstates, depending how you see the connection between the two and provides what amounts to probability distribution over possible measurement outcomes. And this is the usual, the key role of a density matrix or a statistical state in quantum mechanics. And like I mentioned just now briefly, omega can be interpreted as representing expectation value of an observable A via the equation that, well, that omega A equals to trace A omega, right? Which is, and if you read omega as rho, then that's just the usual definition of expectation value of an oper operator given this, the associated density matrix. Especially due to its property of being real, positive, and normalized, it lends itself to a probabilistic interpretation, right? Because you know that's kind of uh, how we would usually interpret probability, for example, through the Kolmogorov of axioms. So this is supposed to connect to measurement outcomes of actual physical experiments by representing the statistics of state uh, state measurement outcomes and expectation values. But how, right? How do we actually do that? And to if we uh, like dig a bit deeper into how this actually works, we sort of uncover some uh, temporal notions associated with probability. So well, firstly, the idea of normalization, right? Classically, the expectation value is given by the integral of a uh, that, that uh, observable uh, multiplied by the density matrix, the classical density matrix, so rho CG, right? And where rho CG is uh, essentially the same as the quantum definition we saw just now, uh, you know, which is the E to the beta uh, H, where H is the Hamiltonian, beta is the inverse temperature, over z, which is the partition function, which is given here, the sum of all possible states given some constraint at Hamiltonian uh, energy hypersurface. All right. Note that z does not depend on time per se, but it does pick out probabilities at a time. Right. If you look at this, right, what what exactly are we summing over? Right. We're summing over all uh, possible states uh, of uh, e beta h at a time. Uh, so we're summing over all the possible states, and that provides a normalization constant to rho CG. And essentially, what I'm saying is, while well, we're trying to consider probability of some particular state given all the possible states at a time, given some uh, probability distribution. So rho provides the weight of that state relative to the entire of some state relative to the entire state uh, set of possible states, and this generates a probabilistic interpretation of rho CG as the probability distribution function for the grand canonical uh, ensemble and the time. So importantly, normalization occurs at a time. And this is the same in a quantum case. I mentioned the definition is essentially the same, but now instead of a sum, we have a trace. And there's a formal requirement that density matrices rho are trace class operators such that trace rho equals to one. But this is just a formal property to interpret this property as like genuine and bona fide, like uh, probabilistic uh, properties. There is an implicit assumption that the trace is taken over possible eigenstates at a time or states at a time, and furthermore, in such a way that the sum of these probabilities occurring sums up to one at a time, right? Instead of at some position. 
right? So we're not just cons considering all possible states at that at some point in space. We are considering some possible uh possible states of a system at a time, right? There's a temporal notion built into this notion of normalization very very softly, right? We will not demand that the probability of an electron having spin up when measured in a Stengel experiment over, for example, the z-axis sums up to one over space. That's just not what we are thinking about when we construct our observables, right? Or demand that the probability of a coin flipping hits here at this spot sums up to one over different times because it's just not true, right? I mean, unless you live in a very, very, very atypical universe, but that's not a, the point here. It's not general at all, right? So time is uh, buried, buried in a normal quantum mechanical case in the terms of our choice observables to represent qu uh, physical quantities, and normalization is an intrinsic part of uh, constructing these observables. Right? And this makes this explicit when you say, well, in standard quantum mechanics, observables are precisely any physical quantity whose value can be measured at a given time. And Anastopoulos and Savido uh, mentioned that the same essentially holds for QFT right, in quantum field theory. Right? Physical measurements are localized in space and time. And hence, QFT measurements require the construction of probabilities for observables that are intrinsically temporal. Right? So again, there's some background re reference to some, some time here. Right? It may not be a Newtonian time, but there is some time being referenced here. And the question is why exactly, uh, you know, whether we can do this in a endless context as well. So it's not a problem at all in normal context. We have access to some notion of time in our everyday context, right? Right, right. You now going to 45 minutes now, this is time, right? But it's a huge conceptual problem for quantum gravity because identifying the right set of observables without access to a background time is a, a problem, right? With which, you know, we want to use this set of observables to then construct Hilbert space or the corresponding algebraic structure. I recall that the, the Heisenberg, the, the algebraic structure started, with, started off with a set of uh, observables. But what is that set of observables requires uh, some, at least, you know, in the normal cases, some notion of time or some notion of time-like stuff. So the first challenge uh, to the thermal time hypothesis, uh, you know, is to provide a norm notion of normalization that does not depend on time, you know, both in the, the, the definition of the state, the statistical state, and also in the definition of the observables in the background. Secondly, the second challenge associated with probabilities. How do expect expectation values represented by the statistical states connect to physical systems to begin with, right? So what? How we have this like expectation value, which is essentially the Born rule for density matrices, and we are asking, well, how do we uh, how do we uh, connect this to actual systems in the real world? And classically, we use a uh, averaging principle, right? What we you know might someone call it a Gordic principle. Uh, there's some subtlety there, uh, but what we observe in an experiment on a system. Is the ensemble average of a phase function for some, some f uh, representing some relevant physical quantity, right? I kind of saw it just now when we saw the integral of f multiplied by rho. So the question is, how do we observe this probabilistic average quantity, which is a probability of ensemble, at least in the standard, standard Gibbs interpretation? Well, one way to think about it is time averages. So over long enough times, the probability of some system being found in some state, some region of phase space, is equivalent to the volume of state uh, region. And this is the standard sort of textbook justification of the averaging principle, right? If you, you know, the phase averages equals to time averages, right? So there's obviously a lot of philosophical debate to be had there, but that's like the sort of standard view. And the second uh, way to interpret it, if you don't like the time average picture, which some, for example, like uh, Wendell and Frick like, criticize this notion a bit, uh, if you, you can think about it in terms of uh, fluctuations, right? So expectation values are values around which measurements at a time might differ or fluctuate from the expectation value, such that we might expect these fluctuations to vanish over time. Over time, the fluctuations vanish and we sort of approximate the, the, the sort of expectation value that uh, was given. As Landau Lishis puts it, for any physical quantity of interest for a single system, in the course of time, this quantity varies, fluctuating about its mean value. So again, fluctuations are in terms of time, Right, maybe there's some uh, expectation value, and there's like move fluctuation all over it. But over time, it sort of circles around, such that you know circles around the expectation value. And for large macroscopic systems, uh, thermodynamic systems, the fluctuation terms approximately vanish, vanish, and hence the quantity itself may be regarded as practically constant in time and equal to its mean value. And this is how we kind of understand uh, whether the system is in equilibrium or not. Right, and. This notion of uh, these notions, time, both the time average uh, and the fluctuation, uh, can be kept, uh, like maybe the fluctuations can be kept in the quantum case. So, the, uh, you know, in the quantum case, and Landau Lishis puts it, the relative fluctuations of additive physical quantities, uh, you know, the fact that they tend to zero as the number of particles increases, makes no use of specific properties of classical mechanics, perhaps except for the idea of particles, and so remains entirely valid in the quantum case. 
So even in the current case, then the connection between statistical states and physical systems appear uh, through the through the expectation values appear to require some theory of fluctuations or change in time or fluctuations over time, dynamics over time. So the second challenge here is how do you interpret the statistical state without a notion of uh, dynamical fluctuations or some background notion of time as a result of these dynamics. Uh, so you need to provide some notion of dynamics without the notion of time. And finally, uh, the final point to make about probabilities is the notion of uh, the notion of unitarity and like you know in the fundamentally timeless context. Part of what it means to behave probabilistically in quantum theory is to have a conserved probability flow. A conserved over what? The ordinary quantum mechanical answer is over time, and this is implemented by unitary evolution. Right? Implemented by unitary operators that conserves the inner product of Hilbert space, so that such that quantities are the form. Uh, we do the inner product with uh, embedded with an A in the middle. Uh, these uh, they conserve the, these quantities are conserves, conserved. So Kucha points out uh, that Schrodinger equation automatically brings in a conserved uh, inner product, conserved in the selected time variable, and the Heisenberg equation does the same with this equation of motion, which we already saw in the beginning. The unitary evolution is sort of picked up by both. Uh, and in normal quantum mechanics, one of the central requirements of the scalar product on the Hilbert states of states is that it be conserved under the time evolution, as uh, pointed out by Isham. In normal quantum mechanics, one of the central requirements of the scalar product on Hilbert space of states is that it be conserved under time evolution and likewise for the Heisenberg picture equivalent uh, analogously. But in the context of the problem of time and a fundamentally timeless ontology, it's not even clear that there is a way to implement unitarity and conservation of probabilities, which are essential to the notion of probability in quantum mechanics. The Kucha notes that nothing similar is generated by the Wheeler DeWitt equation in a geometrical dynamical case, and for the general case as well, general issue uh, notion, whenever wherever the problem of time shows up, this is the general case. So for this entire uh, discussion, we've discussed the thermal time hypothesis as though there already exists some Hilbert space with some conservative product, the concrete representation of the, the algebraic picture, but you know, they are like sort of they fall stand and fall together. But the third challenge is this: find a notion of unitarity that does not depend on time. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, whether this could work. And of course, this is an open question, right? In, in problem in quantum gravity research for a long time now, this is not a new problem. But I just want to highlight this is especially uh, problematic for um, the thermal time hypothesis because it relies on the notion of statistical state, and those require a notion of probability. But we need some notion of probability before we can, uh, before we can get get to get notion of time. But you know, how do we get to that notion of probability to begin with? And there's a bit of security there. So to conclude roughly, the thermal type hy hypothesis appears to be either circular or yet unjustified. But it's important to note that I'm not committed to the impossibility of there being a satisfactory justification period. Right? The history of science shows us that you know, concepts are constantly being extended, developed, the conceptual foundations are constantly being laid again and again. Right, we are constantly developing these uh, new foundations for our new theories, for example, the jump from classical to quantum mechanics. So I'm not saying that this is impossible. I don't want to be that person who like has to eat my shoe in 10 years time, right? But I want to say that this, uh, there is some worries here for the thermal time hypothesis, and it might be true. I want to emphasize that there's yet you know, to be any, uh, oops, it's lagging, yet to be any satisfactory judgment, uh, justification for the use of these concepts in a fundamentally timeless context. So more conceptual grounds needs to be laid in the future, and application, uh, and one worry is that application of thermodynamic concepts beyond the classical domain is not always straightforward. For example, um, uh, Chua, uh, my paper, <laughs> right, uh, forthcoming, points out the relative that uh, extending notion of temperature even beyond the classical domain into a relativistic domain runs into some conceptual issues. It's not so clear cut what the notion of temperature means in a relativistic concept, con uh, context, except when you restrict it to the rest frame, which always to say that it doesn't generalize to relativistic uh, physics in general to begin with. And that is an open question. And along with temperature the issues with work and heat uh, shows up, right? Because they are intricately related. And likewise, entropy, even though the, it's not uh, implicated in my argument, there's some worries about that notion as well. And furthermore, stepping back, the problem time is a tricky and very, very challenging question. I'm not like here to say, well, you know, we, I can I have the solution or anything. I want to point out that the foundations is tricky, but there's, that's, that's why there needs to be more work done in it. Or if we think that you know this approach, Hamiltonian approach, the problem of time is completely point, uh, pointless in the general, uh, you know, then maybe we we should say that as well. We should work on that a bit more, right? So uh, my work with Craig uh, Calendar 
published two years ago, no, no last year, right, t tackles a different pro proposal to the problem of time, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, with similar problems surrounding circularity in terms of the semi-classical time approach. So the problem of time uh, issue is really tricky, really, really difficult. And the question, some one might ask is like, well, is there really a problem of time to begin with? And that's the question that you know I've been thinking about, but I have no good answer yet, right? You know, is this the right way to think about the problem of time? But you know, that's for our future work. Right? So, uh, and now I just want to point out that you know Rovelli does mention preempt some of the challenges I already raised here when he asserts, right? The definition of probability does not require any notion of time. Normalization condition is an a priori requirement that follows from the very definition of probability. And similarly, probability doesn't have to be conserved in time and there's no evolution time. So these kind of maps onto what I've just said about the worries of probabilities, right? Whether it needs time, whether normalization requires time, and whether conservation and unitarity requires time. However, to my knowledge, it's not um, fully been uh, developed yet. Uh, you know, so there's something there. If we want to defend these, these claims, these are I see the answers that we need to answer my address my challenge. And to my knowledge, this has not been developed in full detail. But if there were a satisfactory story which could vindicate um, these claims and more, then hypothesis might be able to confront the challenges here. And that, I'm happy for that. And there will be development, right? There will be progress. And I'm happy for, for that to happen, right? But to my knowledge, now there's still uh, more work to be done. So yeah, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I think I'm slightly ahead of time, but thank you for your time. and. Uh, Please feel free to contact me at this email if you have any questions and I have a draft available. I think I've sent a version of the draft to uh, Jacob. That, I think there's some minor typos there, but the draft is ready. So take a look there if you're interested and please let me know if you have any questions, right? I appreciate it very much. This is a work in progress, right? Thank you. Carla, you're first, go ahead. Nice to see you. Okay. Um, Here I am. Well, first of all, um, thanks to Jacobs and um, thank you, Eugene, for this um, um, presentation. Of course, I'm very happy that um, the idea of um, thermal time has been discussed. And I found, Eugene, your presentation very, um, very clear. I, I just want to perhaps to introduce the discussion also for the others to um, make clear what, what is my point of view about the things you, um, uh, you said. I think I... With most of the things that you presented, um, which were very clearly presented, I think, um, I agree. There's a few points I don't agree, and a few points I, I, I would like just to clarify what is my my own perspective for for everybody to uh, then uh, then comment. Um, I guess the short story is that, um, yes, I do agree that there is some incompleteness in the story of the thermal time, okay? Uh, but no, I do not agree that there's a circularity. In fact, you sort of said either one or the other. Um, I don't agree that there's a circularity, and I, I, I don't agree that uh, um, there is a problem um, related to um, uh, probability and, and probabilities and unitarity and so on. So let, let me try to, to make the, 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 the main point clear. The main point is that um, what is the problem of time we're talking about? Uh, I, I think you, you presented the thermal time hypothesis as one of the solutions of the problem of time. Okay. I, I'm not sure this is a correct way, in my view, this is the way I view about it. The so-called problem of time, which is how to make sense of a theory in which there is a, not a Hamiltonian, but a Hamiltonian constraint, if you want. The solution of that is not the thermal time. So if you take the thermal time hypothesis as a solution to that, I think we're, we're out of phase. We're talking about different things. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the, 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 the problem of time in the sense that you, uh, you mentioned, how to make sense of a theory in which you don't have a Hamiltonian, a Schrodinger equation, uh, that problem has a solution which doesn't need thermal time. And uh, it's, um, it's given by, uh, as you said, using relational uh, variables, noticing that the quantum situation is exactly the same as in the classical situation in general relativity. In general relativity, there is no preferred time variable. There are many time variables. Every proper time, it's a good time. You can define different foliation. There's a multiplicity of times, uh, plural. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe, and uh, perhaps we don't have time to go into that, that's not the point. I and mean, there's a perfectly consistent way of doing quantum theory like we do classical general relativity, namely by never specifying one variable as the time, and instead talk about uh, uh, the relation between variables, some of which being proper uh, 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 clocks measuring proper times along trajectories. So, um, what about unitarity and probabilities in this context? Well, um, there's a full community working on quantum gravity. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I wrote a couple of books uh, in how to do that. So we're not going to that. And in any day, all that, that community doesn't use thermal time. Uh, there are probabilities, probabilities that were defined. They're not conserved in time, not, not because uh, not because uh, probabilities don't sum up to one. Probabilities do sum up to one of whatever you measure. Uh, and if you measure things at different times, which makes sense because uh, observables can be labeled by, by, by one clock or the other, mm. then each observable has a number of possible outcomes, the probability of which sum up to one. What is The reason there's no unitarity is not because probabilities don't sum up to one. Of course, probabilities sum up to one. Uh, the point is that there is no uh, unique way of associating uh, observable labels on time to observable labels at a later time. Mm -hmm. So uh, unitarity fails because time evolution fails, not because some of probabilities to one fails. Mm -hmm. I believe maybe we shouldn't go into that because this is nothing to do with thermal times. I believe this is consistent. It doesn't require thermal time. So what is thermal time? Why, why then talk about thermal time? Because all the story I, 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 gave, I, gave, I gave so far is about mechanics and correlations. And in the experience of the world that we have, uh, there, are, there, are, there are quantities which are different than others. Clocks measure things which seem to be very different than what rules measure. Mm -hmm. So what does it characterize? And there's a large phen phenomenology in, in our experience, which is very temporal, which is not captured by, the by generativity by itself or by any mechanical system by itself. It's only captured by the fact that certain variables behave funny. Um, ice melts, and, uh, and, 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 and we think in time, we remember the past and not the future, and so on. And I believe that, uh, and this is a wide conceptual discussion, all that is related to thermodynamics and not to mechanics. So it's only when we start talking about uh, uh, heat and entropy and memory and uh, position and all these things which are which in, involve uh, um, uh, sort of thermodynamic and statistical notions, it's only at that point that the specific features we call time as different than any variables come in. And the statistic, the, the term time hypothesis tries to capture that. So that answer a part of your objections. It, it doesn't answer your main objection, which is all right. I mean, suppose this is a sub problem that the thermal time hypothesis is supposed to address. Does it do it? And somehow you say, well, sort of yes, but there's the problem. The problem is it seems too generic because uh, 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 as soon as you have a story where we, we can uh, think statistically, and I think we can think statistically just because we, we split the system in two and one system has incomplete information about the other and incomplete information is statistics. So we can make sense of that, of statistics. Um, but then you, you you object correctly. You say, well, it seems to every time, as, as soon, sorry, let's not use time. As soon as you have a statistical uh, a description, immediately you seem to have stationarity. And that seems too strong. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So there's something missing here, which is to mm -hmm. characterize those situations in which um, the statistical state has some equilibrium properties. And uh, as you mentioned, I have made uh, one, in fact, more than one attempt to uh, add to the thermal time hypothesis a notion of equilibrium. There's the one you mentioned, there's one I like better, which I did later in 2016 with um, uh, Jose and Kirko, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, I think, a more refined version of the one, what you said, which is cleaner and I think addresses what you were, um, Am I totally happy with that? Well, I'm not sure. I look forward for you know people like you going into detail and and criticize. Uh, essentially, the idea there is that um, the notion of equilibrium is uh, you need 
to split the system, the universe in three. So two systems are in equilibrium with respect to one another, uh, sorry, in equilibrium to one another uh, with respect to a third system. Mm. Uh, because the third, third system defines the statistical uh, picture. And then if you, if, if you equilibrium is, uh, you know, to, to say that the gas in equilibrium, it says that this part of the gas is in equilibrium with that part of the gas. So it's something mm -hmm. that comes out if you split this. So yes, I do think that, uh, uh, I, I totally agree with you that trying to define equilibrium in a circular way as uh, stationarity and time or something is silly because that's not the point. The point I think is that uh, there is a sense in which you can uh, split the universe in, 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 in systems, define relative evolution with respect to some variables, and then ask if in some sense, one of the systems is in equilibrium, then that's sufficient for uh, uh, underpinning the kind of uh, features of nature that we usually associate with temporality. I only add one last point, uh, which uh, I think you, you raised, and, and then I've done the, I've said everything I want to say, um, which is, um, it, 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 there seems to be a tension between uh, um, think about temporality, which is irreversibility in our experience, flowing time one direction, and using equilibrium, which is exactly a situation in which you don't have irreversibility. Um, I think that could be, can, uh, that's, that's more intuition than else. It can be corrected uh, because uh, uh, you, 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 we can't talk about, because in equilibrium, we can talk about fluctuations. In fact, what we, in, 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 you have, if you have an equilibrium and then you have a term of time that defines a, a, a flow, you, you act on a system some way, you, you evolve for a term of time for a little, and then you, you compute the, the outcome. Things what happen in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory, you can work everything on the vacuum and use uh, uh, endpoint functions. So with, with the same logic, you can describe uh, evolution things within um, uh, an equilibrium with respect to the special time given equilibrium. Okay, so here also, I don't want to go into the details, but I think I, I you see where, where I'm saying. So I, I don't think there's a problem with um, um, probabilities. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, circularity. I think that the well definition of quantum mechanics and quantum gravity does not require term of time. So that, that's not the solution for the time in that sense. Um, the, what the thermal time solves is the funny fact that in a self-consistent description of the world, which doesn't require preferred time, in the world in which we live, there is some variables that behave in a strange way, and that's a thermodynamical phenomenon, and that is consistent with the fact that in a theory without a preferred time, some states may have properties that determine our sense of a flow of time. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Carlo, for uh, coming again. This is uh, <laughs> second. I try to like. Um, <clears throat> that's why I try to sort of narrow my focus a bit, right? And say like, well, you know, even if you disagree, uh, I think in the original paper there is a natural reading of the 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 the, the, the that proposal as a solution to the, the problem of time in the Hamiltonian sense. But I I, I agree with you that that's probably. I clearly agree because I think that's not going to work out. I think in this case, right? So I think in that case maybe. My arguments that will go through circular probabilities, like um, unless you define some relational time already. And but that's an open question. Like, what is the right notion of relational time to define? Of course, you have developed a whole lot of stuff on this, and that's very that's an interesting like uh way to go forward for the problem of time. But that's like I guess my point was, well, what if we looked at your hypothesis and see well how how far can we take it? Can we take it to solve the problem of time itself? And, and then we find some problems. But I think there's still some interesting stuff there. Like maybe, you know, we could think of equilibrium in terms of some kind of dynamics that doesn't require time if we could have some good idea of dynamics in <laughs> in the fundamentally timeless context. But if we don't, like, uh, I also partly, um, I, I, I thought this was it because uh, like I near the end of the slides, I mentioned, you know, the stuff you said, well, you know, probability doesn't depend on time, doesn't all these things. Uh, unitarity doesn't require time, so I thought you know that that seems to if you could get that account going for probability and uh, and time, so probability without time, then you know the problem. Of, then then there might be some way to actually actually do use the thermal time hypothesis to solve the pro the problem of time. Uh, but if we don't, then 
that's that's too bad, right? <laughs> right. But I, and and then uh, I agree with you a lot with the, the solving the sort of maybe like a smaller problem of time, which is you know, how do we get time from when all the variables are on a par? And I, I totally agree with you. That's an interesting direction. And personally, as someone very really interested in foundational thermal dy thermodynamics, it's a very interesting thing to see how we can extend thermodynamics beyond our classical domain. And we're just trying to do things, right? We've, and then we start off just agents doing things, but now we want to say, well, we're going to apply it to black holes and apply it to all these other like new, new domains, but we better have a good understanding of what these things mean. And I, I totally agree. That's like a very interesting, very exciting thing to work on. And I'm like, uh, looking forward to working on that. And I guess uh, with the direction of time stuff, since Eddie's in the, in the <laughs> crowd, you know, perhaps we can think of like thermal time collaborating with <laughs> something like the past hypothesis. I don't know. I think that there could be, or like something interesting there, right? Like, yeah, so that's something we could think about. Uh, probably I will talk about this with Eddie after this as well. But, and I agree with you in general, thermodynamics is weird and very interesting and very, very useful. And we should think more about it when we are trying to do fundamental theoretical physics and philosophy. Thank you. Thanks, Carlo and Eugene. Uh, other questions? I, I always have questions, so I'm happy to go next if people don't have anything else they want to ask. All right, so e Eugene, um, there is one uh, approach to statistical states uh, that I know of that doesn't invoke time in an a priori way, and that's mm -hmm. the Maxent approach. Um, Sorry, repeat, uh, oh, Jane. Oh, Max End. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Max End. Right, 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 right. Yeah. James, right. So mm -hmm. you, um, you know, you, you impose whatever constraints you know should hold for the system. Mm -hmm. And among those is the Hamiltonian constraint that we're getting from, let's say, uh, you know, general relativity, whether we're thinking classically or quantum mechanically. But there mm -hmm. are other constraints maybe that you're also going to impose. Mm -hmm. um, and then you maximize. Uh, the entropy, you find whatever statistical state achieves maximum entro entropy subject to those constraints. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, as you probably all know, this is a way to generate many of the familiar ensembles. You can get the, you know, you know, Boltzmann distribution, you can get the normal distribution, all these things, depending on what you, what you impose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is, at least classically, uh, in, you know, classical statistical mechanics, there is a sense in which by the second law of thermodynamics, we approach uh, such an ensemble, you know, for a system that's sort of left to itself. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the second law strongly suggests that the entropy grows with time and it will keep mm -hmm. growing until it's maximized subject to whatever constraints are imposed in the system. And once it mm -hmm. reaches that, then it is now stationary. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the trick to Maxent is you just skip over the approach to equilibrium and you just you look for what is the statistical state that maximizes the entropy subject to constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, all you need classically is a picture of the phase space. I guess the quantum counterpart would be some statement about the Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm just, I'm just, you know, entropy didn't really show up very much in your talk. But we do think about thermal equilibrium in terms of states of maximal entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's not that there are any maybe any systems that fully perfectly realize a perfectly maximum entropy distribution and stay there forever. Mm -hmm. But if you have some given system and you hypothesize somewhere in that system is some is is some subsystem, some isolated system, something like that evolving, you know, and we write down what it would look like if it were in a, a max end statistical distribution subject to all the constraints that we know, including the Hamiltonian constraint, is there mm -hmm. some sense in which that does potentially pick out um, a, a, a notion of time from the KMS condition? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I just noticed that you hadn't mentioned entropy in your talk and I wanted to bring that up. I see that Gabriella has a, a, a follow-up to this question. Um, okay. Did you want to answer this first or say something or should I, should we go to- Oh, maybe Gabriella's yeah. follow up first, yeah. Please go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out that usually you don't do max cent on the extended phase space. You just do it on positional momentum. If you extend with time, it's unclear what's going to happen because you're not going to try to maximize entropy in time. And how do you define that? That's uh, mm -hmm. And I think it ties into the actual problem that he was trying to solve. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, potentially still circular, yeah. 
yeah, I was going to say maybe like the constraints might sneak in some notion of like uh, isolating specific like time from space already. I think the classical case, there's no worry because, you know, again, we have dynamics, we have time, it's fine. But maybe in the timeless case, there might be a worry there, like Gabriel helpfully pointed out. Uh, yeah, and I guess entropy is maximized over time, right? So I guess the question is, do we have a physical argument for demanding entropy being maximized? I guess we could postulate it. I think that would be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, but I don't know, maybe you'll run into some technical problems like uh, Gabriel pointed out and that might sneak in time. Well, the idea would be that we we imagine we we actually necessarily have to have a system that's doing this or evolving mm -hmm. in time. Just that mm -hmm. given whatever system you have, just you can talk about in principle what such a system would look like. And does mm -hmm. such a system in principle pick out some notion of, mm -hmm. you know, obviously when we're deriving the, the Boltzmann distribution from the Maxent approach, we impose among the constraints that the average energy is some fixed value. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't know exactly how, what that would look like when instead of a Hamiltonian, you have a Hamiltonian constraint. But you know, me, me, I, I, I haven't seen this done before. This is why I was mm -hmm. just asking. Maybe someone has seen it done. Logan. Yeah, I was gonna. I mean, thinking about this in the gravity context, if you maybe if you restrict yourself to asymptotically flat um, gravitational, just I'm now thinking in the classical context. But if you restrict yourself to asymptotically flat systems where you actually do have a well-defined notion of energy, then obviously you can. Um, then you might be able to imagine doing some sort of maximum entropy thing. But of course, if you restrict to asymptotically flat situations, then there's a natural, at least asymptotic you know, time translation killing vector, and you have a notion of time that you've imported by imposing those, you know, mm -hmm. boundary conditions. So I'm not sure. Um, and of course, if you have a closed uh, universe with then you then the then the energy has to be uh, uniquely zero, right? That the Wheeler DeWitt mm -hmm. equation just gives H psi is zero. And you end up with no, you know, if you maximize entropy over the condition that H psi equals zero, uh, you get everything. Right, like, and, and obviously you can't normal. You don't get a normalizable state if you try to do that. So, um, I think I think that notion of like the energy of the system and then maximizing the entropy will will work, but only if you can have a well defined kind of subsystem in that context. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Eugene, do you want to comment on that, or or should we? Oh uh, yeah, sorry, well, I thought, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I guess yeah. Like, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Carlo, go ahead. Now I will follow up to Jacob. Uh, points, Please, yes. If I if I may, um, the, uh, I want to mention for two reasons because it's, it's, it's directly connected to what you said. It's because it's uh, it's uh, it, I think it's clarifying about time. Um, James' idea is to use sort of uh, an epistemic uh, interpretation of ignorance, right? So uh, the the. Uh, let's imagine that we have a way. I mean, of course, there's a long technical discussion behind, but that's put, let's put this apart. Um, we don't to be know. clear. I was not endorsing the no, 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 philosophical sure, sure. approach of James. Merely the technical. Yes, I, I yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm just uh, just putting caveats just to avoid saying wrong things. Um, I think James is super interesting and it's infinitely interesting and in it's uh, its way of looking at, uh, at statistical mechanics. But now, a similar ideas can be used uh, in a timeless context. That's what I want to insist uh, because uh, we keep falling back. Uh, yeah, but usually we do that in time. So what do we do if we not time? Now, in a timeless context, in a general relativistic context where you don't have, I insist, in general relativity, you don't have a preferred time variable. You have a variety of time variables, all related in different funny ways to one another. You can think at the phase space as uh, uh, not as the uh, possible ways the system can be at some time, but at uh, uh, the set of the possible histories of the system, right? So this is a completely time independent notion of phase space, which is it goes back to Laplace, if I remember right, and uh, and it's perfectly well, well defined and is much wider than the notion of phase space um, once you have a time evolution. You have histories, uh, which in, in general activity can be a four dimensional space time with their matter. Um, and the phase space is the space of that. All right, so now what is a statistical state? Well, suppose you do some measurement about the universe around yourself, and you say, well, in, 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 in the phase space of all possible four-dimensional histories, I know something, so I restrict in the phase space the, the region where I know the system is. Good. 
But of course, I don't measure everything. I measure something. So now, James, I, I make uh, a, a statistical state, which simply reflect my ignorance about the rest by suitably assuming that there is no too much uh, technical difficulties. But there isn't a, a priori, because phase space, uh, even in this um, um, uh, covariant way, is a symplectic space. So it has a luvial volume. So you can think about probabilities there. Probability distribution. So you can say, well, I can put a uniform probability I'll do a micro canonical covariant, general covariant, no time here. Um, distribution over uh, possible states, uh, uh, timeless states in which the universe can be. And then you can have, a, a, you can say, well, the, this gives a probability that if I measure something next, I get this or that. And actually, this gives this, if you do this, it matches well with the thermodynamics that we know. It does, because it's a microcanonical, and microcanonical, we know it describes the world well. So this is to insist that there's a well-defined notion of probability, a well-defined notion of uh, uh, you know, predictivity, uh, both statistical, thermodynamical, and mechanical, which don't require at all the specification of um, a notion of evolution, of uh, uh, conserve probability in time, time, special time evolution, or anything like that. Right. Um, yeah, I guess one worry might be that when we talk about, you talk a lot about like measurement and like worry might be, well, in, in this timeless context, like what would measurement mean or what would it, like, you it know, means, as it's a quantum, quantum it case, it would be exactly, like, uh, no, sorry. No, no, because I mean, uh, it means exactly what it means in general relativity. I mean, astrophysicists use a, a timeless notion of measurements all the time, right? Because uh, if I, uh, be, they use intrinsic time, they use clock time, which is uh, in any of the solution of the Einstein equations, they, uh, with, with, uh, with, with matter, there are clocks. So you can ask what is the probability that when that particular clock, not the clock of the universe. That particular clock sitting on Earth to measure the proper time on Earth, which is spinning around the sun. Um, if it's at some time, a uh, uh, proper time, clock time, uh, you see this, what is the probability of seeing that, uh, seeing Venus at a certain distance, five hours in the future? But it's not five hours in a, in the universe of time. It's five hours in, in your clock time. And the theory is not cannot be formulated as evolution in clock time because all clock times are uh, uh, not well defined uh, globally. I mean, clock times are defined locally. So uh, the observability in, in gravity, it's not a mysterious thing. It's a thing that has confused Einstein and everybody else for decades, but is completely uncontroversial in classical generativity. It's subtle, but uncontroversial. And every single thing that makes sense to measure in classical generativity, it equally makes sense to measure in quantum gravity. And like in classical generativity, it doesn't require, we don't require a unique time. There's no formulation of uh, Einstein standard gravity with, with a Hamiltonian, unless you, you go to infinity, you assume, a, of course, you, you assume a syntotic uh, um, uh, boundary conditions which are flat, which is mm -hmm. very useful for some cases, but you know we know are wrong in the universe and not useful in other cases. Right. No, I think I think there's a um it this like so you mentioned that the you know in the timeless context we can have clocks, but I guess in like the case of classical relativity, like um you can't define clocks, but there is space time, right? Whereas in well, it depends on how you want to take it, but you know, in red, like in the context of quantum gravity, which I'm assuming you're talking about, like it's not clear what the ontology is like that supports measurements in the same way, since it's like fundamentally timeless. And uh, that's its worry. Maybe you want to say, well, we shouldn't interpret the problem of time and we let the weight equation as a fundamentally timeless uh, universe. Maybe you should just take the same interpretation as from classical relativity. I think that's an interesting uh, direction to take, and some people have taken that before. But if you want to stick to like the fundamentally timeless, Case then I'm not sure how to because the problem is that we don't have clocks yet. Right? If we have clocks, then even with the small, we can start defining local clocks. Then we can start getting measurements going and stuff. But in the timeless context, it seems like it's not, not the uh, or like it's not clear what it is yet. Let's see the conceptual challenge with that. With that. Well, what what is the challenge you see? 
Right. So measurements happen over time, right? Uh, like even with a clock time or whatever, there's like uh, the measurements happen over some time. You know, in the quantum mechanical case, you can imagine it as an entanglement with a larger system, macroscopic system with a smaller system. That happens over time, right? Uh, so how does that picture of measurement carry over to ah. a timeless context? Yeah. When we don't I have time see. yet. Yeah. So that's a worry. That's a worry I have. Yeah. I think that uh, to do that in quantum gravity, I mean, quantum gravity is a quantum theory besides mm -hmm. being a gravity theory. Mm -hmm. So um, all quantum theories, in all interpretations or almost all interpretation of quantum theory I know, um, we can talk about measurement only uh, under the condition that we are splitting the universe mm -hmm. into sort of a system and an observer. Mm -hmm. So to do in Copenhagen, so to do in the relational interpretation, mm -hmm. so to do in many world, mm -hmm. because many world, unless you have a split, you don't have quantities mm -hmm. that have value and and and, mm -hmm. and so on. So in most mm -hmm. interpretation, so I think uh, the only possibility of of talking about measurement and predictions in quantum gravity is to do that, namely mm -hmm. to split the universe in two parts. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what we we should do in quantum gravity, or at least that's what we could do in quantum gravity mm -hmm. to define. Mm -hmm. the Theory. That's what I do when I think about quantum gravity. In them. so then the situation is always that you have a, a, a sort of space-time region where which is the, your quantum gravity phenomenon, mm -hmm. black hole that collapses and does funny things and then uh, does something else, ends the evaporation, goes to a quantum gravity phase, mm -hmm. and you have the observer part. So um, the uh, the observations in, in, in quantum gravity, but also in classical gravity, always predicated on a split between uh, what you call the, the server, what you call the system. Um, I think this is unavoidable, and I think this is a way we can uh, uh, consistently uh, make sense of um, um, of measurement in quantum gravity, uh, which again has nothing to do with thermal time at this point. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just foundations uh, of quantum mechanics, <laughs> right? So yeah. it it has it has a lot to do with right. So I yeah. think um, if you want to say more, uh, I think the mistake is to try to solve uh, interpretation of quantum gravity without having an interpretation of quantum mechanics at yeah. hand. You mm -hmm. choose one, but then yeah. you you have to choose one. I agree. Yeah. Gabriel, do you have a question? Are you to follow up? I think I also have a follow up. Also, but you go first. I have the follow up to what Carlo was saying. So the idea of going from counting state to counting trajectory, right? The idea is that, uh, you know, you, you put the constraint that the constraint is on the evolution. So essentially you can think of the evolution now as a tube, right? As your constraint, right? As before what you were doing was taking a section of the tube and counting the states there. And now the idea is that you want to count the trajectory. Now, the idea that you can do that uh, in a covariant way, if and only if uh, all the cuts that you do in you know the, all the different servers can do give you the same uh, measure, and that basically uh, wants to have uh, a common syntactic structure of uh, not just uh, you know uh, space uh, and uh, and momentum but also time energy, and the issue is that you uh, you have uh, that uh, uh, um, structure precisely if you're assuming uh, that uh, the entropy is constant over time. So uh, this is where uh, uh, I'm worrying about the circularity of the argument. Like, are you trying to uh, uh, find the sort of constant entropy states uh, or are you trying to impose it? Because if you're imposing, that's fine. You, you put in your symplectic structure, you have what you have. But if you're trying to look, you know, if you're trying to do the max end uh, to get to your, uh, uh, um, to your equilibrium, to find your equilibrium, then you can't just impose the structure that you need to get to get those equilibrium all the time. So that's sort of where it becomes a little bit trickier. And then I said that I, I don't know how exactly you're going to be able to use Maxent uh, in, into uh, into these spaces again, because I, I can assume that I have the, the symplectic structure. Like just to, to give a, a simple example, if you imagine a a, a dissipative system like a damped harmonic oscillator, you would have a symplectic structure for each cut, but you're not going to have a symplectic structure on the whole space time because the system is dissipative. Uh, I'm not sure I've understood. Maybe, maybe you maybe you may make a good point here. Can't, what 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 forbids me to use uh, 
a covariant phase space, not phase space at the time? I'm confused. So space it's not, you, you can always do it. The, the issue is whether the, the, you, you really have a symplectic structure on the whole uh, space-time uh, uh, momentum energy. Right? You and, do. It's a theorem. Well, you, you do. It's a theorem. It was proved by a lot of people independently. Witten being one, Ashika being another, and they were independent. Well, groups. what I'm saying is that it depends on what uh, sort of equations of motion you have. As I said, if you have a, a, a dissipative system, right? If you, if you... Ah, no, no. If you have a dissipative system, no, you don't. Right. Because right. I agree. Right. But that's, point. that's the so, point. Like the conditions on which you can do certain things, which is the conditions on which uh, 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 you're putting the symplectic structure is exactly the condition for which you're asking that the entropy over time uh, is not uh, is not changing. Ah, okay, yeah, sure, right. sure, but so, uh, sure. But, uh, but, sure. But the point the point is that since we were trying to use the max end to, to find the, the condition of equilibrium, well, now the symplectic structure we're already imposing it, uh, so like we are not finding anything. We're finding something that we already imposed with the structure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But you know, imposing that gives the right terminology. Happens to give thermodynamics correctly. That's uh, why we believe the micro micro thermodynamics because it gives a covariant uh, a notion of entropy. Yes. I, I was just going to add that you know. For me, the confusing step in going from, you know, a picture of thinking about statistics on sort of four dimensional trajectories in classical general relativity to the quantum case. Um, in, in, in the classical case, I, I have an intuitive picture of what embodied observers and clocks and so forth, you know, look like. I can draw a space time diagram. I can draw a bunch of particle trajectories that are bound together that define the world volume of a human and, and the clock and I can put them into this uh, into the space time and I can impose all the laws of physics that I understand on on what the, that trajectory has to look like um, you know, and then I can tell a story in that four-dimensional picture of this observer you know looking at the clock running experiments doing measurements and trying to to to, to, to come to some uh, you know, derive some credence probability for which four-dimensional trajectory the observer is on, right? The observer is trying to figure out, I'm on some four-dimensional trajectory, I don't know which one, I will gather evidence to figure it out, and then I'll pin down which four-dimensional trajectory I'm on, and then once I've gotten some data, maybe I can project forward. If I have, you know, some strong credence, I'm on a particular, you know, uh, a co you know collection of possible four-dimensional trajectories, and I see that most of them on some appropriate measure have something that happens in an hour, then I can make a prediction this thing will happen in an hour. And this is this is kind of the picture that one can tell. Um, I, I guess I just don't know what that picture looks like in quantum gravity because, and this is again, to get to e Eugene's response to Carlos' point, I, 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 I don't know what embodied observers look like anymore. I, they don't have locations in space that I can point to. I have, it, it seems like a much more rudimentary structure of some Hilbert space that I can divide up into subsystems, but I don't have a well-defined notion of space. Uh, and, and in this classical picture, although it is kind of a timeless picture because we're thinking in terms of trajectories, each four-dimensional trajectory includes temporal and spatial directions in which I can tell stories. I, I don't know how to, how to describe those kinds of stories in the quantum version of this. This is why it seems more mysterious to me, but I think this is like getting at, at what Eugene was, was saying before, but maybe from a different perspective. So it just seems like it's it's harder in quantum gravity than it is in the classical case, even when one is thinking in a timeless way about uh, thinking statistically about whole trajectories. Right. Yeah, I think I think you got that because you basically kind of summarized probably in more elegant terms than what I wanted to say, essentially. Yeah, it's very nice of you. Uh, Logan, I saw your hand up for just a moment. Did you want to uh, say something? Um, I saw that Carlo had unmuted himself and maybe he wanted to say something about- Oh, no, you go ahead. Question. I've been talking, to, I've gone talking too so, much. I, I, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, I, I wanted to ask Eugene, to what to what extent are the are the problems that you just, like the, the big framing here, okay, about sort of the problem of time, um, to what extent is that a, sort of an artifact of the Wheeler-DeWitt approach? Because, you know, in a sense, what you're doing is to get that, you sort of canonical quantization of 
GR, you're starting with GR, you're going to a three plus one ADM formulation. You're quantizing that using kind of the standard, you know, constraint systems approach. And then you get Wheeler. So like you've taken a path that already has singled out time as opposed to a say path integral approach or, you know, something else. And I, and I wonder, you know, to what extent your, um, the, the the framing of your of your problem is is partly just an artifact of that um, approach to quantization. Right, uh, I, I I agree. Uh, it's the in the sense that well, I guess the the ADM or like the that that formulation seems the most intuitive when I think about things evolving in time, and this is how at least when we do GR, you can, it's kind of the most dynamical way we can look at GR, right? Like three metrics evolving in time, and. Uh, yeah, and then when, uh, I guess to point out that it's not like you're yeah, singling out of time in that sense because you're foliating in a special way, but you know you do get the other three momentum versions of the wheeler the equations as well. So in that sense, like you have an equal, equal problem for space, but maybe it's less concerning than time in some sense. Um, and usually people focus on the first equation, which is the the wheeler the weight equation. But you can there are three ver momentum versions of the 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 same uh, equation as well. But I do agree. That I think it's a Something I, I haven't like I've been wanting to think about more like what is how exactly can we maybe think about other ways? But I think it's hard. Like it's a very hard problem to even get to. It's hard to even get to this first uh, first way of quantizing, and there are probably other ways of doing it as well. And yeah, I'm still I'm still thinking about that. So <laughs> don't really have a good. I I do think it's an artifact of the way we have quantized, but maybe there are other alternatives that I'm still looking for. I have a follow up to that, which is hmm. you know if you put quantum gravity in a box and you do ADS CFD, then yeah. you, you inherit time from boundary theory. And, you know, at least for certain kinds of questions that potentially can be answered, you know, questions about the bulk in ADS CFD that have to do with quantum gravity, you're doing quantum gravity with time that's inherited from something else. So, I mean, it- um, you, you only lose our universe, which is not ADS. That's- <laughs> That's, I, I didn't say all questions. Notice I was very careful in what I said. Well, I mean, but in a cosmological context, you you usually do have a preferred full, a notion of foliation, right? I mean, we do have a cosmological foliation, right? To the the foliation to which respect the CMB is 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 in thermal equilibrium, and in. Curiously, yeah, that's, that's what, very curiously, yes. That's there, there's you, there's that's a thermal you, system that's invariant. <laughs> That's what intuitively, you know, from a long time when I first heard about the thermal time, that's what intuitively makes it so appealing is the fact that we live in a universe in which there is a thermal system, the CMB, which is in equilibrium with respect to a particular preferred foliation, which also happens to be the foliation that all of the planets and galaxies and everything, you know, so like there's something about our universe that does in some intuitive way match this. And, and you know, Jacob, your point about, you um, ADS is similar to my earlier point about, you know, if you pick asymptotically flat boundary conditions, that also gives you a preferred, um, at least asymptotically preferred foliation to which you can then define an asymptotic time. But um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, if, I, if I may comment on that directly, uh, what, what at the time in which I was working on that convinced me that thermal time is interesting is exactly a calculation which is in the paper following the first, uh, the first thermal time paper, which is that if you take Current uh, 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 cosmology with uh, with a uh, with a background uh, uh, the cosmological background radiation you consider it as a statistical state uh, and you compute what is the corresponding thermal time you get the Friedman time the cosmological time so it it seemed to be a, I mean posteriori it might seem obvious but it uh, uh, you just don't you take generativity which doesn't give you a preferred variable just make a measurement with the fluctuations you do you write the most reasonable state classical statistical state that describe it compute the time and, and you get the what we call time so um of course this works only in the homogeneous approximation as soon as we go outside the homogeneous approximation everything gets messy um if i gabriele want to say something i have another comment maybe maybe i let gabriele talk first i don't want to I, I have a question, but uh, you can finish uh, the discussion. Okay, so let me uh, let me comment on what you were saying before. Uh, I, I do agree that the wheeler dewitt equation, <laughs> the wheeler dewitt approach is not the best way of getting an intuition about quantum gravity. I think the best way to getting an intuition of quantum gravity, it's functional integral. It's just uh, sum over geometries. Uh, 
on a, with a boundary. So that's my best intuition about quantum gravity. Namely, you split the universe in two, again, because this is quantum mechanics. Uh, you're outside the system, you're classical, you're, let's use Copenhagen, it's the simplest, okay? Let's use Copenhagen. So you have a classical world. In the classical world, there's a quantum gravitational phenomenon. So here, here for a time. So outside is classical. So how would you do? You, 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 you enclose in a, in a sort of four-dimensional box your quantum gravitational phenomena. Everything outside is classical. On the boundary, you have the state, okay? And inside, you don't have space, time, because you have some of all possible geometries or possible messy stuff. But the observables live on the boundary, and you know exactly what you're talking about because on the boundary is you measuring. I don't know the, the thing, the the, the the thing that falls into the black hole, the thing that comes out to the end of the evaporation. You make a measurement, and the, the theory tells you what is the probability for something coming out given something going in, or what is the joint probabilities, or uh, or whatever. You don't need a time variable for that. You just, you know, give us a measurement here. You can get some measurement there. And you don't, you don't need thermal time. You need thermal time if you have incomplete measurement here, incomplete measurement there, and you want to say which one of my variables that I can measure here and there works mostly like a time variable. But that's a different story. I mean, forgetting thermal time, I think that the, Jacob, you were saying, what is the right intuition I can use? That's the only, it's very close to what you were saying. Look, let's do ADS uh, um, CFT and put everything in a box. Agree. But why you wanted to put everything in a box with ADS? Just put everything in a box and forget ADS, right? And put everything in a finite box. Finite in time, finite in space. That's what we do in, uh, for, for a particle Feynman, right? So that if I have a particle X and T, what's the probability of seeing it X prime T prime? What's the amplitude? Then there's a story how to go from amplitude to probability. Well, intuitively, very easy. You sum over all path with with a complex um, uh, uh, amplitude. Same works in quantum gravity. I think that's not conceptually complicated. If you ask what happened in between, it's a mess. Like what happened in between for the particle it goes everywhere. In between, there is a superposition of all space times. But what we're talking about, which is the amplitude for seeing something given that something else has been measured, that's clean, seems to me. Yeah, as long as you don't open the, the box, I guess, it's just don't, don't think about, don't and, look and, about, think about and, the And of course, the defining the gravitational path integral in four-dimensional space-time is non-trivial. No, of course. I mean, that's been my <laughs> life. <laughs> 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 that's like, it's not trivial. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel, go ahead, please. Right, so my question is uh, how then uh, all the ties to sort of uh, uh, like uh, operational definition of time. So I am in my lab, I have to create my timing sigma uh, system in which sense uh, my timing system is actually measuring a fluctuation of your, uh, you know, equilibrium defined somewhere, right? That, that's the question. So the question is, how do we get from these notions of time to sort of the operational laboratory notion of time? Right, in the sense that you say, okay, yeah, this is very appealing because I have a cosmic background and so on. Yes, but I don't define uh, the my, my clock based on the cosmic background. Maybe you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I always look at outer space when I define time. Right. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Jim? Is there, is there uh, how would you characterize this? Right. Yeah, I think that's a that's a worry. Uh, I think uh, I didn't work on this in this paper, but uh, so, uh, no, no Swanson that definitely did in his uh, his paper. He talked about some issues con uh, connecting physical time and observer time to. I guess uh, Carlo has here worked out uh, the you know the, uh, for I guess when you are uniformly accelerating through like you, you know under radiation, there, there is a sense in which the thermal time can uh, can you know connect to physical time in some uh, ratio. But of course, there's a very highly idealized case where you are uniformly accelerating internally through uh, under radiation in the, the right wedge of, <laughs> like you know, render space time. So uh, I don't know how that how realistic that is. I think it's an open question. I mean, I'm sure that there's more work done since then, but I think it's still an open question, like how that connects, and there's a worry there. So even if we got back time, like maybe that time is isn't fully what we think time is. 
And that's that's a worry. At least if you think that the, the right thermal time is the CMB time. But we can maybe look at things in equilibrium around us and try to define thermal time with those things as well. Nothing's stopping us from doing that. They maybe they be that might be a <laughs> easier operational way to think about it. But I don't know what, what does Carl, Carl think. <laughs> Gabriel, is your question how you I connect thermal time to the to your watch? Is that the question? Well, so the question is like we, we define uh, you know clocks uh, right now with fountain clocks and so on. So we we have a, a particular way, a particular procedure, right? We define it like that right now. And I don't see right away a straight connection. Actually, when we are doing that, what we are actually doing at a deeper level, we are actually measuring these fluctuation of these, uh, you know, time defined this other way. So that that's the connection that I would need to sort of to be convinced that oh yes, the thing that we are defining here mathematically is actually the same thing that then we use uh, uh, experimentally to define time. Okay, so I I, I would react it this way. Uh, what we use experimentally with clocks that we build, and uh, um, it's it it's well defined by mechanics. Doesn't require any thermodynamics. So we have a, a theory of the world, um, classical or quantum, depending on what kind of clock you're you're, you're building. For for a for a classical clock, you just have a pendulum. So you have an equation of motion for a pendulum connected to the equation of motion around quantum mechanically. You have Fluctuations also, and um, and so uh, this just uh, the, what we call time variables, just one of the variables, one of the measurable things. Um, if I have a if I have a clock, the simplest clock is a, is a pendulum. I have and, and and I do its its uh, its physics. Um, I'm measuring two things. I, I have the the hand of my watch, and I have the angle of the uh, with respect to the vertical of the thing. So I have two variable x and alpha. And my physics, I want to think of my physics as uh, mathematics that give it a correlation between alpha and T. Not as an evolution of alpha and T, but just a correlation between these two quantities. So I have a table, I, I make repeated measurement, alpha T, alpha T, alpha T, and I find out that after I've measured the two or three uh, 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 couples, the other I can predict, give one, given one I can predict the other. To, to some extent, I can give uh, in quantum mechanics, I can give amplitudes given one finding the other. So if I think in this way, um, I'm, I'm just doing, I'm just finding out variables that can be measured and for which uh, equations expressing correlations work well. And clocks are just convenience ones that gives, that simplify the equations. It's an old idea by Newton, by the way. So a clocks is a it's it's a it's a it's a a variables like the others, okay? It's a different question. Why those particular variables that we happen to call clocks, which are a family that clicks in in in, in, in together somehow they they remain nicely correlated. Why they have this peculiar set of features that we call time, and I think the second question. Um, has no answer in mechanics alone. Has only an answer when we look at the fact that there are thermodynamical phenomena around us. By, by itself, otherwise we wouldn't distinguish the T. I, I, I'm, I'm not going, uh, like, I'm not going to understand. I mean, you could define a clock by taking a, a mass of uh, a radioactive material that has a known uh, half time and use that as definition of your clock. And then at that point, there's really nothing mechanical about it. So I, I'm not saying that... Uh, uh, the, 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 the nature has to be mechanical or not. I'm, I'm just saying uh, uh, we have this notion of phenomena that have some sort of regularity that we use uh, to, uh, um, to measure time. And uh, uh, if the idea that uh, time is really a more intrinsic level defined uh, like this uh, in uh, with this uh, thermal uh, equilibrium uh, defined, uh, I need to show that whenever I'm doing uh, these... Uh, ah. Apparatuses. I'm looking at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I agree. Whenever you introduce well, you know, new notions of time, you have to make sure they line up, right? Yeah. You know, there's thermodynamic time, there's cosmological time, there's psychological time, and then of course in general relativity, there's a gazillion different. And 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 so natural question is, how do we ensure that these actually link up, and mm -hmm. and are because it's not obvious they have different definitions. 
Good thing. I think, you know, Jacob, you had an interesting point earlier that I think is, is relevant here, which is part of this boils down to finding some natural division of the universe into subsystems, right? That was and Carlo's point. <laughs> I, there were several, well, you made this earlier in the point about classical GR and essentially using, let's say, you know, a, a two body planetary system as a clock that you're using and measuring stuff with respect to that, you know, quote unquote natural clock, right? We know that in GR, there are solutions that look like things orbiting one another that act like, you know, not sort of naturally occurring clocks and we can measure, you know, this is what, this is what the ancient astronomers were doing basically is they were saying, I have this thing and I can measure positions of stars with respect to the- yeah, And it's even, planet, it's even right? more tricky because of course in relativity, you want to use a clock that's pretty close to yourself. You don't want to use a clock that's a light yes, year away right. because you run into all kinds of problems. And this is where it gets even trickier because I don't know what it means to say that a system is right nearby <laughs> it may be quantum gravity. In classical GR, I know what it means. Well, so this is where I, you know, um, I think I think Sean Carroll had some had done, wrote a paper about sort of are there kind of natural tensor product decompositions, right? In other words, okay, within some just create, you know, I've got a Hilbert space. This is in Mad Dog Everett. It is. Yeah, are there is kind it. of natural tensor product <laughs> decompositions where subsystems evolve sort of somewhat independently, and maybe there's a a principle of you know minimizing the interaction Hamiltonian or something like that, that and and that seems to lead you know and of course there's there's work in 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 uh, QFT obviously on constructing tensor product decompositions um, based on the algebra based on the QFT algebra. You don't have all that structure in quantum gravity, at least not beyond the perturbative um, framework. But but you know maybe there's a notion there of you know, of some sort of privileged tensor product structure in which you can define subsystems. But, you know, Sean Carroll is very explicit that he takes time to be a fundamental parameter in Mad Dog Everettianism, right? He has a fundamental Hamiltonian and, yes. and, a, and a single Hilbert space, which he assumes is finite dimensional. And, you know, uh, no, 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 I'm, I, yeah, there's it's, a lot it, of there's a lot of assumptions that, go, that goes into that. But I do think this notion that there might be privileged tensor product decompositions of arbitrary Hilbert spaces with respect to something is an interesting notion that's you know um and, and I, th I i think in the in the classical gr context actually the the um the gps observables is a particularly that was another one i think of carlos papers is a particularly interesting notion of how do you define how do you define observables over a much larger space time Yeah, Sean Carroll's noticed that in the quantum gravity case it doesn't work it's, uh, because it doesn't have its uh, so in the paper says, oh, maybe the thermal time could be used there. That's <laughs> without elaborating. So the only comment that I have on this, I mean, I can imagine using an equilibrium uh, as a time because uh, I can make a fluctuation out, uh, out of the equilibrium and then see how it takes to go back to equilibrium. And then I sort of have a clock like that. Okay. Instead of having uh, the pendulum that goes back uh, and forth, I have something that I keep going in and out. Of oh, yeah, yeah. No, Gabriele, that's the idea of thermal time. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, uh, that's intuition behind the thermal time. Right, but then the idea is that is just another way that I can define a clock. It doesn't seem to me that it's more uh, uh, like fundamental than the other. I mean, is it in what way? When I'm, you know, when I'm looking at, at a clock uh, that that is actually a pendulum, I'm really more, uh, uh, you know, more fundamentally actually I'm looking at fluctuation out of equilibrium because I don't. See no, no, I think my perspective on this is not that there is a time and therefore how do we find it? We have to understand what we mean by when we say this is a time, this is a clock and this is not a clock. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and it seems to me that uh, if we try to solve this, uh, this question, um, we just don't have an answer in mechanics. We have to resort to thermodynamics. This is an old idea. I mean, I didn't know wrote about that. Even Feynman has some points about that. I, I'm not disagreeing. I, 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 I think that it's right. I just, I, I, in this particular way, I don't see the connection. So if, if I had an argument that told me, look, when you're, when you're actually looking at a pendulum, actually there is this thing that you're doing. For, for example, 
the, the, the pendulum is going to lose momentum and therefore you need to put in momentum. And whenever you're putting in momentum, it's kind of like a mere perturbation out of equilibrium. And then, uh, you know, because you, you need to periodically put in the momentum. So you, you could maybe make some argument like that, but then you would tell me, ah, really what you're doing is really perturbation out of equilibrium, right? But I, I don't know that I buy this just because I made it now in, in, in one minute. But it, you know, if, if we had consistent something like this, that I did, that I basically say, look, every time that I'm making something mechanical, I'm really secretly doing this other thing because you have to consider the mechanical system also. Oh, yes. Yeah. Then I would be fine, right? But I, I like this bit uh, that then I, it ties everything together. That I get it. Yeah, that should be filled. I agree. Exactly, Gabriele. All right, this is an excellent stopping point because we are just about at the hour. I wanna thank Eugene again for a wonderful talk and for uh, leading us through a really wonderful discussion. I wanna thank everybody here for your questions and, and, and your ideas. Thank you for um, you know spending your time with us these past two hours. It's really great to see all of you. I hope all of you are doing well. Um, the video of, of this talk and, and, and the discussion in Q&A will be posted shortly to the uh, seminar series website, along with a draft of the paper that Eugene has provided. Um, otherwise, take care, everybody. Stay tuned uh, for an announcement for the next seminar that will be in two weeks. It's great to see all of you and be safe and be well. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, everybody. Bye.